while I was up here about 70 seconds ago, because our take a minute's a minute 14, and I didn't say good morning. So good morning to everyone. Oh, it's good to be gathered, sunny day out, and now we're going to get into the Word of God. So thankful for that. Uh, the title of my message is The End is Near, and roughly three minutes ago, we, we talked about these graduates, these six people who have made it seemingly to the end of something specific, and I know for them, that's celebratory. For me, when I was a senior, I remember the last day when the last bell rung, and I celebrated because that was it for high school for me, and it was awesome. And this morning, we're going to talk about the end being near because the first verse in our passage in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, talks about the end of all things being at hand. So we'll talk about that in a moment. But I want to talk about something that I think is not always easy or comfortable to talk about, and that is the end of life. Now, I know on a Sunday morning when it's nice out, we come in here in the auditorium and when we talk about the end of life, that's not like, yay, that's super exciting, right? Uh, it's challenging. And I think kind of reflection of that in our culture of how we know it's challenging to talk about the end of life is all the euphemisms that we have for the word death, right? When people die, we say they've, they've passed away, they've moved on. Maybe we'll say that they've went home or they're in a better place. It's like we, we have all these euphemisms to, to try and cover up the sting of, of death in that reality. But for a moment, I want to, let's, let's think through this question. I want to give you a scenario and then we'll think through it. And we could obviously give more thought after this, but we'll just give some initial thought to it. So imagine later today, June 9th, 2024, you find out that you only have five years to live. Just five. No more, no less. From this day forward, five years. Now, if that was true, and that really was told, that was told to you, and, you, and that was the reality, how would that change things for you as the individual? And more specifically, how it would change things, how would that change your thinking? How would that change how you go about things, your actions? How would that change things? And that's five years. What if we lowered that and said later today, June 9, 2024, you found out with 100% certainty that you only had one year left to live, 365 days. How would that change things for you? How would that change the way that you think, change the way that you act and go about your day-to-day -day life? Now, I, it would be interesting to actually give some substantive time to that question and then have some conversations. I would love to hear what people would say to that. But I think collectively, a general theme would be true, that for most of us, it might look different, but for most of us, if we found out we had a year left to live, or five years, we would live with a greater sense of urgency, a greater sense of intentionality, and a greater sense of purpose. Now, how that plays out in our lives, that could look different, but I think that would be a common theme for us, right? More urgent, more intentional, more purposeful in how we go about things. As I said a few moments ago, our text this morning in verse 7 starts out with the words, the end of all things is at hand, hence the title, the end is near. And we're going to talk about this idea of the end. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment and explain that, but it's from that perspective, with that in mind, with the end being near, that we're to do these certain things as followers of Jesus. And the apostle Peter, ultimately God, is going to call us to live with a greater sense of urgency, intentionality, and purpose in light of the end being near. Now, the letter in 1 Peter, we know it's to elect exiles, and we as followers of Jesus are elect exiles. We do not have home field advantage. We understand that, right? But what's interesting in our text today, these five verses, verses 7 through 11, they're addressed specifically to Christians, followers of Jesus, and how we interact with other followers of Jesus inside the family of God. This is a family ordeal. Now, that doesn't mean we ignore non-believers, right? We, we understand that, but this text does focus on those within the family of God and how we interact and engage with one another. And so there's going to be a lot of application for us, but I just want to quickly address, if you're not a follower of Jesus, one is, I'm super, we're super glad that you're here. And as we talk about the end being near, my hope is as we talk about this, even in just a few moments, you, you think through that. You think through what it means that the end is near, you have that perspective, and I, I just, my prayer is that you would just consider, that you would just consider what the Word of God says, and you would just consider 
what it looks like to follow Jesus this morning, that you consider doing that. And I also hope that as we talk through this text, there's no such thing as a perfect Christian or a perfect church, but that you would see that the people of City Point are striving to live these verses out and apply it to our lives, even though it's not perfect, we get it, but that we're striving for that. So I'm going to read 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, and then as is our practice, we'll go through it verse by verse and work to explain it and work to apply it to our lives. So let's start in verse 7. The Apostle Peter writes that the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Now pause as we continue in these next few verses. I want you to make note of how many times the word or the words one another is used. So verse 8, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory in dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, let me pray for us, and then we'll work through the text. Father, thank you so much that we get to study your word this morning, prepare our hearts and minds for this, help me to articulate your word well, and to say what's already been said, but in a way that's relatable for us. And I pray that as we work through the text, you would help us to both understand it, Lord, and in that also to apply it to our lives. So thank you for this time together. Amen. So I'm going to read verse 7, and then we'll go from there. So verse 7, here it is. The end of all things is at hand, therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Now here's our first point, just comes in the first verse, it's this. Knowledge that the end is near should kick us into gear. I did not try to make that rhyme originally, but it just happened, okay? Knowledge that the end is near, it should kick us in to gear. Last week's passage, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, verses 5 and 6, ended with the return of Christ and his final judgment. This verse, verse 7, continues on with that theme, and he talks about the end of all things is at hand. So to understand this, I want to take us through briefly the redemption story of the Bible in four main segments. And you could word these things maybe differently, these four segments, but here's, maybe this will help us picture this. So the Bible is one big story. And it starts with creation. And then we have the second section, which is the fall. And then the third section, which is redemption. And then the fourth, which is consummation. So let me briefly walk through those. We have creation. Most of us know that, right? God created the cosmos. He created us. Everything was beautiful, and it was good, and it was awesome. And then we get Genesis chapter 3. We get the fall, where humanity disobeyed his loving rule and command. They disobeyed God. And then before God drove us out of the garden, he made a promise in Genesis 3.15 saying, one day I'm going to send a savior who's going to crush the head of the serpent. And ever since Genesis 3.15, all the way up through the Old Testament, it's like leading towards the fulfillment of that promise. That's what the Old Testament does. It's where you get to the book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. And in between the Old and New Testament, there's about 400 years of silence. And then that silence was broken by the cries of a baby, and his name is Jesus. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. He grew up and lived a sinless, perfect life, and then he went to the cross. Not, he wasn't forced. He willingly went to the cross and willingly gave up his life, and after he died on the cross, he was taken down, and he was put in a tomb, and we know he didn't stay in the tomb. Three days later, he rose and came back to life, And then he ministered to people for several days, and then he ascended to the right hand of the Father. Friends, that's creation, fall, redemption, but there's still another part, the consummation. Jesus isn't going to stay there for all of eternity. Jesus is going to return. He is going to come back, but when he does, he's not going to die. He's coming to establish his dominion and his reign and rule forever and ever. And so you and I, we as individuals, as the church, we are living in the end times, which is the time between redemption and consummation, between the resurrection of Jesus and the return of Jesus. We are currently in the end times, and these were inaugurated by the resurrection of Jesus. We've been in the end times for about 2,000 years now. It's a long time. 
And the question is, how long will we continue to be in the end times? It could be another 2,000 years. It could be another 2,000 days. It could be another 2,000 seconds, which means by the end of this gathering, Jesus might have returned. We don't know. But he does say in verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. We are headed towards the end. We are headed towards the consummation, towards the return of Christ. And there's that word there right after where it says, therefore. Therefore. In light of this reality, therefore, we are called to do these things. So we are, as followers of Jesus, to have this eternal perspective, which is going to help us kick things into gear, which means that knowing the return of Christ is near, we're not just supposed to sit around idly and passively twiddling our thumbs, waiting for things. We're not supposed to panic and lose our minds and freak out and all those things. And we're not supposed to endlessly debate when Jesus is actually going to return and try to predict that. What we're supposed to do is kick things into gear. And he starts by saying this, Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. I think the ESV does a great job overall at translating from Hebrew and Greek to English. But I think in this context, the word self-control, that's not a great reflection of the original Greek word. The original Greek word, I think, is better translated as sane, S-A-N-E, or clear-minded. So clear-minded, sober-minded, these ideas are to be taken together, and it's the idea that we are, as followers of Jesus, we're supposed to have a clear mind about things, we're supposed to be level-headed, and have clear thinking, specifically about verse 7, the end of all things being at hand. So I, I think of it like this, all right, we are, we are headed towards eternity. We're headed towards eternity. And I think of eternity like an ocean, and I know every analogy has its flaw, and here's the flaw. The ocean is limited. Eternity is not. Eternity is forever, right? The ocean isn't, but the ocean's vast. So think of it like this. Think of eternity like an ocean, and think of your individual life like a single drop of water. Now, if you were to drop one single drop of water into the ocean, that doesn't seem very significant, because it's not, right? That's tiny in comparison. And the point here isn't to say that our lives are insignificant. It's quite the opposite. He's saying, in light of eternity, your lives are significant, so make them count. The point is, live with a greater sense of urgency, intentionality, and purpose, because your life counts. I love what Thomas Schreiner said in a commentary he wrote on 1 Peter. He said, the knowledge that believers are sojourners and exiles whose time is short should galvanize them to make their lives count now. And so the end being near, again, it it shouldn't lead us to passivity or idleness or speculation or panic, but the first thing he says is being self-controlled and sober-minded, it should lead us to pray. It should lead us to pray, where we will discipline ourselves and actually have the self-control to pray to God because we have this eternal perspective. We know eternity is ahead of us. We want to make things count, and so we pray with that perspective in mind, It leads us to pray because we're dependent on God. And I think it also leads us to pray what I would call high altitude prayers. We're we're zooming out, seeing the big picture of the Bible, right? And where we're headed, the end of all things being at hand. And we understand where we're all headed, headed towards eternity. And so we say, God, my life is like a drop of water in the entire ocean. It's, it's, It's small and it's brief and it's short, but help me make it to count. You think clearly about the end, and so you pray those type of prayers. You think clearly about how there might be followers of Jesus you know in your life who if they don't follow Jesus and he returned today, they would go to hell. And you think about that, that weight and that reality, and it leads you to pray where you're you're clear-minded, you're sober-minded, and you pray, God, save their hearts. Bring them from death to life. Do a divine work in their life. Give me the courage and the wisdom to navigate these difficult conversations. And so for the sake of our prayers, we remain clear-minded and sober-minded. And I would say this, if you're not a follower of Jesus, again, I'm super glad you're here. And my hope is that, that you would see that the end of all things is at hand, and this would make you think about your eternity. Because every human in this auditorium and who has ever existed is a forever being. We all live for eternity. So the question isn't if we'll live for eternity, it's where will we live for all eternity? Will you have eternal life and spend it with God and his people? Or will you experience eternal punishment, damnation, and pain? And 2 Peter 3.9 says this. This is beautiful. This is Peter's second and last letter. 
He wrote, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You could say that Jesus has not yet returned because he wants you to repent from your sin and have a relationship with God so that you could have everlasting life rather than perishing for all of eternity. And so, again, my hope and my prayer is that this morning, with the end in mind, you would think through that and then you would give serious consideration to following Jesus this morning. Now, Peter, he's going to continue on in verse 8, and he's going to talk through a, a multitude of things to do for, that we're to do within the family of God. And he talks about the end of all things being at hand. And for me, when I read that, I'm like, is, is, he gonna, is Peter going to tell us to go out and just change the world, be world changers? We're going to shatter earth, and we're just going to do amazing things. And when we read the text, you could argue he is actually calling us to do that. It may not just be the way that we, we think. And so here's our next point, and we'll see this in the next few verses. Here's what he calls us to do in light of eternity. He says, we're to love one another. We are, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we are to love one another. Again, I, I get it's not an overly eloquent phrase. In fact, it's really easy to say we're to love one another. But I think we also understand that though it's easy to say that, it's not always easy to do, right? It's not always easy to apply that and to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. But look at what he says in verse 8. He uses the words, above all. There's this emphasis throughout this letter that Peter has on loving one another inside the family of God. 1 Peter 1.22, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. 1 Peter 2.17, love the brotherhood. 1 Peter 3, 8, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love. And then we get to this verse, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. We're to love one another, right? And all the other commands in this verse flow out of love, but we're to love one another without ceasing. We're to keep on doing it. It's this constant, genuine, sincere, continuous love that we're to have. And as we do this, the result is the second part of verse 8. It says, love covers a multitude of sins. Think of Proverbs 10, 12 in this respect, where it says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. It's this idea like that hatred, it's almost like it uncovers, uncovers sin in a sense. And we know that, that the church isn't some event that we attend and, and we stop attending. The church is the family of God. And as a family, we understand that we sin against each other because we're not perfect, Right? But when we sin against each other, we're supposed to love one another because that covers all offenses. And when we don't, it says the opposite, hatred it actually stirs up strife. It's as if someone sins against you, and rather than forgiving them and dealing with it in truth and grace, you shine a spotlight on that sin to belittle that person and to elevate yourself. It's as if when someone sins against you, you, you allow that offense to build up and you build resentment and bitterness towards that person. Or when someone sins against you, you retaliate and you sin against them as well. That all stirs up strife, but love, love covers all offenses. It covers a multitude of sins. And to deal with one another in love, to engage with one another in love, is to deal with sin with both truth and grace. And both are important. I love what David Helm said in a commentary again on 1 Peter. He used this illustration to describe this verse, and so I'll read this. I just love the picture it gives. He says, love takes the oxygen out of sin the way a blanket chokes the air from one caught on fire. Similarly, as long as oxygen is present, forest fires rage. But if we could take the air away, the blaze would settle down and great tracts of land would be saved. May we, as followers of Jesus, love in this way. May nothing evil be allowed to breathe for long. May we keep short accounts. The last days demand our sincere love. Again, within the church, because it's the family of God, there's going to be fires, right? Because we sin against one another, because we're not perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect Christian or a perfect church. But when we love one another earnestly, and we keep on doing it, rather than adding oxygen to the fire where that sin and the toxicity and dysfunction spreads and does more damage, it removes the oxygen from the fire. And rather than just mitigating further damage within the family of God and within individual Christians, it actually sanctifies us. We become more like Jesus, one degree at a time. 
and it's beautiful. And so it's normal for us to confess our sin to God and one another. And it's also normal for us, should be, for us to forgive one another. And when we deal with one another's sin and with one another, again, we're to do so with love. And that includes both truth, but it also includes grace, both of those things. Now, I say all that, and it's like, man, that sounds great. But if you've ever been a part of a church for more than maybe a couple of weeks, right, you get to know people, like, it's not always easy to love people, right? I kind of think of it like this. You ever play a game, or some of you, maybe it's a video game, and there's different levels of difficulty. You have the easy level, and then you have the medium, and then you have the hard level. Well, how, how many of us know that we could probably fit people in the church within those categories? Yeah, you got the easy, the easy to love people. Yeah, that's good. Then you got those who you put in the medium, medium difficulty. But then we all know people, right, who are in the hard category to love. And so you say, well, Jesus says we're to love one another. That includes all three difficulties. And so how in the world are we supposed to apply this when it's not so easy to do, right? Well, I think we need to go to the, the scriptures for this. In John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35, this is so key, so important for us. He says, a new commandment, this is Jesus, I give to you that you love one another. And here it is, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Church, Jesus' love for you as an individual is not like the stock market where it's unpredictable. It's not like a roller coaster where it goes really high and then it dips really low and then it's everything in between. And it's also not like the sun in the great northwest where it's present for one day and then it's absent for a week, right? The love that Christ has for you as an individual is this constant, unwavering, steadfast love that is not fake or flawed. It is sincere, it is genuine, it is perfect, and it is beautiful. And here's the thing. We know ourselves, right? If you put a mirror in front of your own soul, like, it's, it's not always the most attractive thing, right? We sin, we're broken, we're flawed. And if we were honest with ourselves, if we were to put ourselves in a category of easy, medium, or hard to love, I think we put ourselves in the hard to love category, and yet, here's the reality. Jesus knows you better than you know yourself. Like, think about that for a moment. He knows you better than you know yourself, and yet, he still loves you with an unwavering, steadfast, genuine love. I say that here from the pulpit, and yet, at times, it is so hard for me to truly, truly, it, deep down in my soul, believe that about myself, that Christ would, would love me in that way, knowing myself, right? Right? But that is it. That is the good news of the gospel. That even when our love and our faith for God wavers, his love for us does not. And so I go back to 1 John 4, 19, and he says, we love because he first loved us. And so when we talk about 1 Peter, verse 8, and we're to love one another, this is not a love that can be manufactured. We can't just fake it till you make it. You can't just force it. It is a love that is supposed to be genuine and constant. And the love that Christ has for us for you is an effective, it's a transforming, it's a sanctifying love. And so as we have received the love of Christ and have continued and are continuing to receive it, God is working in us and he's transforming us. And that love that we received, we now extend to others by the grace of God. And I get it's not always easy, but Jesus didn't say love one another when it's easy or love one another when they're just in the easy category. He said love one another. That includes easy, medium, difficult. But he also says, love one another as I have loved you. We can't forget that part. And so these next couple of things, he's established this, that we do these things in love, and these next things flow from love. So look at verse 9. Peter says, show hospitality. Again, this is done in love. Show hospitality to one another. And then there's two other words in there. You see that? He says, without grumbling. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Now, when Peter wrote this, he didn't have the iPhone. What's the newest one? The 17, 16? You get it. The newest iPhone. And he didn't have the Airbnb app or Verbo where he's, he's like, I'm going to head to Jerusalem. Let me just pull out my iPhone and book a hotel or an Airbnb. He didn't have that. And so when these followers of Jesus would travel from town to town, they were dependent on one another to host them, to show hospitality so they could stay and have food and shelter. 
But also historically, this was a time where persecution was starting to rise against the early church. And so Christians were being displaced from their homes and needed places to stay. And so hospitality was a necessity, and I would argue it still is. It just, we're in a different culture now, different context. But the command still applies to show hospitality to one another. Now, there's a family that I, I, I want to mention that I knew years ago uh, when I lived in Vancouver, Washington, that taught me a great deal about hospitality. What, what Peter's talking about, they exemplified so well. So at the time, I was 19, and I was getting near the end of my sophomore year in college. I went to a university uh, in Portland called Multnomah, and I did that so that I could get an education and train to be a pastor in pastoral ministry. And one of the ways that I wanted to do that was the church that I was a part of at the time, incredible church, and uh, there was an internship that they had going, and I wanted to be a part of that for the summer. The challenging part, my sophomore year was coming to an end. The school was in Portland. The church was in Vancouver, but my family lived in California. So I kind of had two options. I could either move back to California for the summer and skip the internship, or I could stay in town and do the internship. The problem is I didn't have anywhere to stay. Thankfully, the leadership in that church found a a home, a, a family within our church that was willing to host me for the summer for those three months. And I'll never forget this. I remember it was the last day of my sophomore year. I had a 2000 Mustang at the time, so there's basically nowhere to sit in the back, just the two front seats. And I shoved everything from my dorm room into that car. I probably tied some stuff on the roof. And um, I remember driving from Portland to this home in Vancouver. Now, I had never met this family before. I've never even talked with them on the phone. The leadership of the church took care of all of that and coordinated this. So this was going to be my first time meeting this family. And I, I wasn't terrified, but I was pretty anxious. And so I remember pulling into the driveway. I was probably shaking at the time and sweaty and all that. But I remember pulling in, and I remember parking my car. I'll never forget this, right in front of the house. And the wife was standing right outside with a smile. And my heart's racing because, like, we're strangers at this point. I remember getting out, and she greeted me with a warm smile and uh, brought me inside. And they had a finished basement, which is where I stayed. And so her husband was down there getting the bed ready and everything fixed and ready to go. And from that point forward, though I was a stranger, they treated me like I was one of their own, like I was a family member. I remember each Friday, almost every Friday, they would go out on date nights and go to different restaurants throughout Portland, Vancouver area, and they would invite me to be a part of that every Friday. I remember I'd drive in the car with them, we'd eat at the restaurant, and they would treat me to to dinner. And afterwards, they're like, hey, you want dessert? I said, absolutely. So they treated me to dessert. It was great. (laughs) I'm not going to deny you the right to bless me. Um, So that was great. And then I also remember, because I was interning and busy with all that, I I could use some extra income. So they allowed me to mow their lawn, and they paid me to do that on a regular basis. So I had extra cash. And then I'll never forget, it was my birthday in August, and I was coming upstairs to the living room, and I wasn't expecting anything, but they had balloons in their living room and happy birthday signs for me, like just showing me love and, and celebrating me on my birthday. And, and I remember studying this passage years ago in First Peter. And, and by the way, I stayed with them for another summer after that. So they showed hospitality for two summers. Pretty incredible. Um, but I remember studying this passage a couple years ago, and I got to this verse where it says, show hospitality. I started studying that, and I couldn't stop thinking about that family. And so I reached out to them, and I just said, hey, I, I just want to let you know, I know it was years ago, but Thank you so much for exemplifying what Peter wrote in this passage. You guys impacted me in ways you won't even know about till eternity. And I remember they responded and, and affirmed what I had believed all along, but I remember they responded and said, we viewed you as a son the whole time you were here. And it, I felt that. like th- They treated me like I was family. They showed that sort of hospitality. But, but here's what else they did in verse, in verse 9. They showed hospitality to me without grumbling. Now, I, I wasn't like a bounce off the walls wild 19 year old. Like I was respectful and all that, but I was living in their space over two summers. That's half a year. And they gave me full access to their pantry. Was that a mistake? I don't know, but I, 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 I had full access. So I ate a lot of their food. All right. I used their hot water. I, I mean, I, I remember he would wake up on Saturday mornings. I'm not a golf guy and no shots at golf, but he, he would watch golf and I was like, could you like watch basketball or something? But anyway, I would sit down in his living room and I, I'm just there with him in the morning and like I'm invading his space in a sense. 
And so they had every right to grumble in that way, but they didn't, right? They did it with a loving and a joyous heart. They exemplified this and showed hospitality to me, and it has impacted me ever since in a lot of ways. And so I bring all this up because we are to show hospitality to one another. Now, that doesn't mean all of us can show hospitality, right? It's not like summer's right around the corner, so I'm giving some plug to say, hey, you want to host someone? Although, hey, you never know. That could be cool. And not all of us should show hospitality in that way. But some of us might be able to, right? Some of us might be able to show hospitality in that way. Others of us, maybe it's, maybe it's you just you invite someone over to your house for some games. I know a lot of us like games. Some of us in here are really competitive too. I won't point any fingers, me. Um, right? We like games. We like, like invite someone over for coffee. But it's, we're to show hospitality to one another inside the family of God. That's a really important thing. But here's a question we could ask ourselves. If a follower of Jesus, let's say they were displaced from their home for one reason or another, would you open your doors to them? And if you open your doors, would you do it without grumbling? Love is the key that would open up your door to those people. And so we have to think through that for ourselves. But regardless, here's a, maybe a, a challenge slash encouragement for all of us. I want to encourage you to do this. It's June 9th. It's beautiful out. Praise God for that. The weather's going to be wonderful this month. And uh, this is a great time, great opportunity to invite someone, a part of City Point Church, over to your house to show hospitality. So that's my challenge and encouragement to you. Before the month ends, before June ends, I would encourage you to find someone within City Point Church and be proactive and invite them over to your home and show genuine, sincere hospitality to them. It's a great time to do so. So again, show hospitality is done in love. Now we get to verse 10. This next command is to be done also in love. Look at what it says. It says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So you and I are to serve one another as brothers and sisters in Christ with the gifts that God has given us. Gifts here is a special ability that God distributes to his followers by his grace. Now, if you look at the text in verse 10, it says, as each has received a gift. The question isn't, do I have a gift? The question is, what gift has God given me? Or what gifts? It's assumed here that every believer has a gift. God, by his grace, gives every believer a gift. Not just one, you could have multiple, but every single follower of Jesus can contribute to the family of God because every follower of Jesus is gifted. The question is, what gift or special ability has God given? by his grace, given you. For some of you, maybe you are skilled when it comes to music, and you have a passion for it. Or maybe it's, maybe it's teaching, maybe it's cooking, maybe it's drawing and painting, maybe it's writing, maybe it's building stuff or main, maintaining things. Maybe it's thinking through details. But God has gifted every single follower of Jesus in this room in certain ways, and here's what we're to do with them in verse 10. We are to use those gifts to serve one another, but here it is, as good stewards of God's very grace. That means that you and I, though we have gifts from God, we don't own those gifts. It's almost like we're managers of those gifts that God has given to us by his grace, and we are to be good stewards of those gifts. And so the question is, yeah, what, what special ability or abilities has God given you and how can you store that? I think of it like this. My wife, Piper, God has gifted her in ways that are so different than myself. And I thank him for that. And one of the ways that I think she's gifted is coming when it comes to cooking. She's a really good cook. Now, I'm not that. And I don't really have a desire to cook. Now, obviously, as I said earlier, we are the family of God, right? And part of being a part of when you're part of the family of God, is needs come up. Whether it's someone has a newborn baby and they need some meals, or maybe someone experienced a loss and it's a season of grief and they need some meals. Now, if I was to serve the families of City Point by making them meals, I would put a lot of effort into it, but it would probably be equal to me buying Hot Pockets and pizza rolls and giving it to them. <laughs> I obviously wouldn't do that, but I'm saying the quality wouldn't be like if my wife were to make a meal. My wife, she's, she, I, don't, I don't know if into is the right word, but she, she has a passion for sourdough bread, for making sourdough. And she does 
all the stuff that you do with sourdough. And then she gets the little, there's like a little blade that you can cut it and make it look very nice. And so if someone needs a meal, my wife will just, she'll do the whole thing with sourdough, bake it. It looks beautiful. And then she'll make this amazing, healthy meal and put it all together. And it's like, for her, it's got to look good to taste good sort of thing. They're like, combined. I'm still figuring out how that works. But it looks good and it tastes good. And, and so when she'll deliver a meal to someone in need, man, that, that family feels blessed because she's gifted in that. In fact, the other day she was making food and she was just expressing to me, I just, I just love making food for people, healthy food that like they can enjoy. And for me, if I was to have to sit down and make sourdough bread, I would pull my hair out because I just, I don't think I'm gifted in that or passionate about it, but I'm gifted in other ways that she's not. But regardless, she is using the good gift that God has given her by his grace, and she's being a good steward of that to serve others in that way. And I'm trying to do the same. And so, again, the question is, what gifts has God given you? Each of us has one. There isn't a single Christian who cannot contribute to the church, the family of God, because we're all gifted. And so, what is that? Is it, is it you're good at cooking? Are you gifted in that? If you are, then, then serve as a good steward of God's grace. Are you good at singing? Then serve as a good steward of God's grace. Are you good at fixing things, right? There's always things that need to get fixed. I have a whole list at my house if you want to talk to me after. Okay, maybe not, maybe not. But well, maybe you do, we'll see. But the reality is if you're good at fixing things, serve as a good steward of that gift that God has given you by his grace. And so as we continue on, let's look at this last part of verse 11, or the first part of verse 11 that will lead us to the end. This has to do with continuing this idea of serving kind of in two distinct areas, broad categories. Verse 11 says, so whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. So if our serving, if it includes speaking, we're to speak words of God, words that are in step with scripture and are in submission to scripture, words that point to God. And if we serve, we're to do so with the strength that God supplies. How many of you know that if we were only to serve when we had a full tank of gas energy-wise, we probably wouldn't serve a whole lot or at all because life's tiring and hard. But we are to serve with the strength that God supplies us. And so when we speak words that, that point people to God, when we serve in a way that relies on God's strength, what it does is it glorifies God as Christ is working both in us and through us. And so this leads us to the last portion of our text this morning, the last part of verse 11, where it says, in order that. So here's number three. Here's point number three. Here's what this all does. One another love brings glory to whom all glory belongs. One another love. When we love each other in these ways, all these things that Peter's saying, it brings glory to whom all glory already belongs to. The last part says, in order that in everything. So all of these things are in order that it's like this funnel that we are to glorify God because all glory and dominion belong to God. And every single thing and person that exists, exists to bring glory to him. That's true whether or not you're a follower of Jesus. You exist to bring glory to God. And I know that's contrary to what our culture says, where our culture says you exist for yourself. But we have to remember verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. In light of eternity, our lives are like a single drop of water in the ocean. Again, that's not to say our lives are insignificant. It's quite the opposite. It's in light of eternity, we're to make them count. That's important for us to understand. And so I think it would be silly for us, unwise might be a better word, unwise for us to live for that single drop when we could live for the ocean. To live for us and ourselves, me, myself, and I, when we can live for God and live for eternity in our forever future. And what happens is when we love one another, it glorifies God because love is relational. This is not the love of self. It is a love that we receive vertically. And as we're being transformed by that, we're also extending that love horizontally. And as God is, as Christ is working in us and he is working through us, God is glorified in all of that. And so this leads us to our big idea for this morning. The essence of our text is this. When we love one another, God is glorified. When we, as brothers and sisters in Christ, when we love each other, God is glorified in that. And in all of this, again, Peter doesn't just say, hey, love one another, it glorifies God. 
he says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, dot, 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 love one another, it glorifies God. So we have to live with the end in mind. So let's think of ways to prayerfully respond. We'll come to a conclusion here. But for some of us in here, maybe, maybe we've been a little passive as we follow Jesus. And we've said to ourselves, you know, one day down the road, I will commit to these things. But it's down the road. And I remember for me in middle school, there were things that disciplines I wanted to start, right? Habits I wanted to create. And I said, you know what? When I'm in high school, I'm going to do it. And then I got to high school, and I'm like, okay, I still haven't done it. But when I'm an adult, adults got it all figured out. Then I'll do it. And then you're an adult, and you're like, ah, okay, when I'm in my 30s, I'll do it. And then it just keeps going, right? And so maybe for you, you've been saying, you know what? I'm going to plug into the church. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve. I'm going to exemplify love in these ways. But, but I'll do it later. Maybe for you, you remember verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. And this is spurring you to a sense of urgency and intentionality and to be more purposeful. And so this morning is a time for you to start kicking things into gear. The second thing maybe we could reflect on is a question. Is your life as a follower of Jesus, is it the one another life? And what I mean by that is that the Christian life is the one another life. The Christian life is the church life. They're not distinct things. We follow Jesus in the context of the local church. And what's interesting here is if we try to apply this text, we cannot do so apart from relationships. We are to love one another, hospitality to one another, serve one another. These are all one another commands that necessitate relationship. And so for one reason or another, you might have tried for a long period of time or short period of time to withdraw yourself from community and isolate yourself but this is where I would really encourage you to get plugged in. To get plugged into community and start establishing relationships within City Point Church. And I would encourage you to take a proactive approach in that. Because sometimes with relationships, we take a passive approach and we say, I just want someone to reach out to me and show me hospitality. The verse doesn't say receive hospitality, although we should receive that well. It says show hospitality. That's for us to take a proactive approach. And so I want to encourage you, even before you leave today, I would encourage you to find someone, invite them over, play some games, drink some coffee, whatever you want to do. Just have fun. Show hospitality. Build relationships. That's important. For all of us as well, I would, I would maybe pose this question. Are you loving, are you loving with a sincere, genuine, constant love one another? those in the easy category, the medium, and the hard category. And we have to remember 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us with his effective transforming love. And friends, we're not easy to love, but Christ loves us with his unwavering love. And maybe for some of us, that's like, we got to focus on that because maybe we don't believe that. We say, I know myself, Christ couldn't really love me with that. His love has to be like a roller coaster that wavers. I, I, I can't be assured of that. Well, you could look to the cross, right? Christ demonstrated his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, he died for us. He died because he loves you. And so maybe for some of us, we have to let that truth sink in that Christ really does love us even when he knows us better than we know ourselves. And when we can truly receive that, it's that love that transforms us and empowers us to be able to extend that same love towards one another. And then lastly, for followers of Jesus, here's just the question to think about. How has God gifted you? How has he gifted you? And how can you serve others within the church as a good steward of God's varied grace? You're to do so by the strength that God supplies, is what the text says. Because we can't always supply our own strength, right? We're dependent on the Lord, which should lead us to pray. But how can you use those gifts to serve the church? And lastly, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I said earlier, we're so glad you're here. My prayer all week has been that you would, you would think through the end of all things being at hand, and you would give consideration to following Jesus. And so I want to conclude with 2 Peter 3, 9, where it says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Jesus has not yet returned, though he will. And he has not yet returned because he wants you to turn from your sin and turn to him and have a relationship with God and inherit eternal life. God does not want you to perish. 
And if you'd like to further a conversation about that, or you say, you know what? There is a sense of urgency. I want to follow Jesus yesterday, as in I want to do it right now. Then you can talk with the person that brought you. You can talk with someone with a lanyard or myself. At the very least, we have these next steps card in the seat backs in front of you. I would encourage you to fill one of those out, whether you receive Christ or you want to receive Christ and further that conversation, and we'll follow up with you. But let me pray for us. And then after we pray, we'll respond with one final song. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your word. It is living and active. God, it does inform us, but it challenges us. It convicts us. It comforts us. It does all those things. God, we, we have this simple command to love one another. And yet, even it's, in its simplicity, it's so profound. And we thank you, Lord, that even though we're commanded to do that, you don't just leave us hanging. You say, love as I have first loved you. And God, it's your love that actually changes us and makes us more like your son, Jesus. And in that, Lord, you are working in and through us for your glory. I thank you for your love first and foremost. And I pray that we would be a church, a City Point church, that when people look at us, they would see a community that is defined by love. Love that's received vertically, love that's extended horizontally. But God, we thank you that you love us. That is good news. So Lord, we're going we're gonna to sing of your praises. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your word. And God, thank you for your love. We praise your name this morning. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.